Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Ericsson stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Ericsson is a telecommunications company. It sells infrastructure, software, and services in information and communications technology for telecommunications service providers and enterprises, including 3G, 4G, and 5G equipment, also internet protocol and optical transport systems. This company has been a major contributor to the development of the telecommunications industry and is one of the leaders in 5G. Ericsson is the inventor of Bluetooth technology. The company is headquartered in Stockholm, Sweden and was founded in 1876. It trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Zetra, Euro TLX, NASDAQ Stockholm, NASDAQ Helsinki, Buenos Aires, BATS, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 34 billion market cap. They're trading at 1032 a share and they have 3.3 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have lots of free cash flow and it grows a ton from half a billion up to 3.6 billion. All these numbers are converted to US dollars since their financials are in Swedish kronas. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that peaked in the trailing 12 months at 2.2 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company. And that goes up nicely each year from 23 billion to 25 billion. This is the company's income statement. All their numbers are in Swedish kronas. The top line is the revenue, the sales. That was 231 billion kronas in the trailing 12 months. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that peaked in the trailing 12 months. Below that is their operating expenses. These are all the expenses not directly tied to making the product or providing the service. Below that is their operating income, which looks really good. It grew from 2 billion up to 31 billion, almost a 16 X growth. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was negative in 2018, but a big positive in the trailing 12 months. As you get lower on the income statement, the growth gets more exaggerated. You see their growth in revenue from 210 billion to 230 billion. That's a fairly small percentage, right? Their gross profit growth is nearly 50% from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. Their operating income growth is about 1500% from 2018 to trailing 12 months. And since they have negative net income, we can't calculate the growth, but it's even more exaggerated because it went from negative to their biggest positive ever. This is the income statement from the latest quarterly report. This shows us the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. This shows us the third quarter of 2020 versus the third quarter of 2021. Their revenue went down a little bit from 57 billion to 56 billion. And the company said the main reason for the decline was due to China. Their networks division and digital services division declined a lot in that country. Here's a breakdown of their third quarter revenue. North America, they do 20 billion of their 56 billion. Europe and Latin America is 14 billion. Their largest revenue by far is with networks, close to 41 billion. Digital services is 8.6 billion, that makes up 15%. Managed services, 5 billion, that makes up 9%. And other is 2 billion exactly, that makes up 4%. Their R&D revenue is pretty steady. It was 10.1 billion both quarters. It did go up a little from the first nine months of 2020 to the first nine months of 2021. R&D expenses increase in digital services due to increased investments in the cloud native 5G core portfolio and also an emerging business and other, which stem from their acquisition of Cradle Point. Selling and admin expenses went from 6 billion to 6.2 billion. The increase is mainly due to the acquisition of Cradle Point. Ericsson is looking to grow its 5G portfolio. That's why it acquired Cradle Point. Cradle Point is a market leader in wireless edge, wide area network solutions. It looks like the company paid $1.1 billion. They had a really small amount of impairments 
They had half a billion in other operating income and expenses. The increase was mainly due to 400 million kronas of a market revaluation of Ericsson Venture Investments. Their EBIT or operating income went from 8.6 billion to 8.8 billion. It grew a lot in the trailing nine months from 17 billion to almost 20 billion. And their net income went up a little bit from 5.6 billion to 5.8 billion. It's even better in the trailing nine months from 10.4 billion to 12.8 billion. This is the company's statement of cash flow. As a top line, it's operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. In 2018, even though they reported negative net income, they actually generated 9.3 billion of cash flow. That's due to all the non-cash expenses they passed through in the income statement. But they grew that more than four times from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. It's nearly 38 billion. Their growth is phenomenal. And they do spend a lot of money in CapEx. They spent five billion in the trailing 12 months. It peaked in 2019 at 6.7 billion. But they can easily afford that. That's a fairly small percentage of their operating income. Operating income minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they have a lot of cash flow remaining each year. Every year they reduce debt. They reduced it nearly seven billion in 2020. That's another way to reward shareholders is by reducing debt. It's less interest you have to pay on the debt, which means more free cash flow. The higher the free cash flow a company has, the more it can give back to investors in the form of a dividend payment, or the more it can reinvest back into the company to grow it, or even buy back stock. This is their operating cash flows from their most recent quarterly report. This shows us the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. Also the third quarter of 2020 versus the third quarter of 2021. The way you calculate CFO, you start with your net income, then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then you have to adjust for changes in working capital. Their net income was 5.8 billion kronas. We have to add back the 2.8 billion of taxes because the taxes on the income statement are not the taxes the company pays. That's the taxes according to IFRS. The taxes they actually paid were 1.3 billion. They have to pay what the government tells them to pay not what the accounting rules say. But it all evens out over time. Some quarters they'll calculate more in taxes than the government says. Some quarters they'll calculate less taxes than the government says. We have to add back 2.4 billion of depreciation and amortization. They purchased 3.9 billion of inventory in the third quarter, so that's a cash outflow. They received 8.8 .8 billion from trade receivables and contract assets. That's pretty much their accounts receivables. I'm going to explain later what contract assets are. Even though they reported a 5.8 billion profit, they actually generated nearly 15 billion of cash flow. This is their investing and financing section from their statement of cash flows. The first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. Third quarter 2020 versus third quarter 2021. So they spent 1 billion in PP&A. They sold 40 million of PP&A. They invested 190 million in product development. They invested almost $8 billion in interest-bearing securities. These are usually short-term marketable investments, so they earn a little interest rather than just keeping the cash in a savings account. So they had a cash outflow of $9 billion in their investing section in the third quarter. In their financing section, they had $161 million of dividends paid. They repaid a lease liability of $580 million. The company talks about other financing activities. This is the collateral received in credit support annex agreements and bank borrowings less than three months used for short-term liquidity purposes. So in their financing section, they had a cash outflow of 2.5 billion. In the third quarter of 2020, it was 886 million. Let's look at their capital structure, 11 billion of equity, 4.6 billion of debt. They're 70% equity, 30% debt. And they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have 2.6 billion of cash left over. I gave them the middle whack on Finbox, 6.5%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 58 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $51 billion. We divide that by 3.3 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $15. They're trading at $10, so they're trading at a 33% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to grow 3.2%.
So I grew their revenue 3.2% for the next four years. And to calculate their future free cash flow, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers, I divided by these four revenue numbers, and that comes out to 8%. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 8%, that's how I got their future free cash flows. Simply, Wall Street values the company at $17, they're saying it's 40% undervalued. Two analysts price this stock, one says $14 a share, the other says $18 a share. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. The stock is up from two years ago, but it looks like it broke through $15 in the beginning of 2021. Lots of buying activity. But it has come down, it seems like it keeps coming down. Even though the company is performing better than ever. They have a really low beta, 0.11, so the stock is not volatile at all. It's gone down 11% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 29%. The 52-week low was 10, the high is 15, and the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. In the past 10 days, an average of 10 million shares have been traded each day, so it's a pretty active stock. Of the 3.3 billion shares outstanding, 3 billion are on float. When a share is on float, that means it's available for investors like me and you to purchase. 10% of the shares are held by institutions and hardly any of the shares are shorted. They pay a semi-annual dividend, it's at 12 cents. They used to pay a much higher dividend, but it seems like it's come down. They did raise it a good amount from 2020 to 2021. They pay a 2.25% dividend yield, which is 35% of their net income, 21% of their free cash flow. So there's definitely room for the company to raise its dividend. Their dividend is a little lower than their industry. Their industry pays a 2.4% dividend, Analysts are forecasting the company to grow its dividend at 2.6%. It's not a good sign to see a company decreasing their employee count. They were at 120000 now they're at 102000 If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $14,000 today. That's only a 3% annual return. Insiders really like this stock. Lots of buy orders. That's a good sign if you're an investor when you see insiders buying the stock. 60% of the shares are held by institutions, 32% by the general public, and 8% by venture capital and private equity firms. Investor AB, the Swedish investment bank, owns 8% of the stock. They own a quarter billion shares. Then PrimeCap, BlackRock, and Swede Bank. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have great price multiples, a 16 PE, price of sales of 1.4, and price to book of 3.2. All better than a market median and average. Here's a list of their long-term assets. 3.6 billion of capitalized development expenses. That's an intangible asset. 37 billion of goodwill. And 4 billion of intellectual property. 14 billion of PP&E. 8 billion of right of use assets. They have a bunch of financial assets. And 25 billion of deferred tax assets. They have a great ROIC of 34%. Their ROE is 21%. Their current ratio is 1.3, so they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. And their quick ratio is 1.0. They have 35 billion of inventory, 10 billion of contract assets. I'll explain what this is in a little bit. 39 billion of accounts receivables, 14 billion of other receivables, 15 billion on short term securities, and 46 billion of cash. A contract asset is pretty much accounts receivables. I think it's easier if I give you an example to explain how it works. Say you have a contract with a customer and you have to deliver 10 items to them on January 1st and 5 items on June 1st. But according to the contract, the customer will not pay until after the second package is received. So when you ship 10 items on January 1st, the customer owes you $50. But you're not going to receive any money until June 1st when you send the second package. On January 1st, you have to book $50 of revenue onto your income statement. When you send an item to a customer, it doesn't matter if you received any revenue. You have to book the revenue. That's how accrual accounting works. And then you have to add to your balance sheet $50 for contract assets. Because assets have to equal liabilities plus equity. You're adding $50 to your asset section and $50 to your equity section. Because everything on the income statement flows down to the bottom line, and at the end of the accounting period, net income is transferred to retain earnings. Then when you send the second shipment out, you're sending five items for $25.
Now your customer is going to pay $75, $25 for the June package, $50 for the January package. Now you book $25 onto your income statement as revenue, you increase your cash balance $75, and you decrease your contract assets $50. So on June 1st, you increased your assets $25, 75 minus 50, and you increased your owner's equity $25. So your balance sheet balances. They have 6.3 billion of provisions in their current liabilities. Provisions are funds that are set aside to pay for future losses. They have 10.2 billion of current debt, 2.2 billion of leased liabilities, 32 billion of accounts payable, 41 billion of other, and 34 billion of contract liabilities. Contract liabilities is the same as deferred revenue or unearned revenue. It's when Ericsson receives money upfront before they sent the customer the product. When they receive the cash, they increase contract liabilities on their balance sheet and also increase cash on their balance sheet. When they deliver the product to the customer, then they increase revenue on the income statement and decrease contract liability. They seem to be well capitalized. They generated 3.6 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have 4.1 billion of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. And they paid out 773 million US dollars of dividend payments. So they have nearly $7 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 10 companies in the same industry as Eric. And if Eric has number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're better than average in all the price multiples. Their PE is 15.6, average is 20. Price of sales is 1.4, average is 3. And price to book is 3.2, average is 4.4. Their current ratio is lower than average, but 1.3 is fine. A lot of companies in this industry have negative earnings. They have the best ROE at 21%. They're lower than average in debt. They're a little lower than average in market cap. And a lot of companies don't pay a dividend. They do pay a dividend, but it's lower than Eula Packard and Cisco. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 33% discount. And this company is at the forefront of 5G technology. They have lots of patents. They've been around forever. And they're still growing organically and through acquisition. So this is definitely a great long-term hold. I rank their free cash flows 9 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.